John's going to talk about today is actually uh, only one aspect of that. He is a scientist who does cellular and molecular work, so if you catch him on another day, he can tell you about molecules uh, and uh, cells. Um, but today, he's going to talk about uh, clinical trials, and he'll give you some definitions of that. But just remember that every time you make a discovery, um, we have to take it to a patient and test in a patient. But um, you know, it's one thing testing it in one, two, three, or four, or five patients and seeing that it works okay, and another thing, seeing whether or not it works in a whole series of patients. And the, really, the discussion around the whole series of patients is what John's going to talk about, and finding whether or not uh, innovations, new drugs, new inventions actually are critically analyzed in patients before you let it get out into the community. You wouldn't want to give something that didn't work, because that might be expensive. You might not want to give something that's unsafe to patients, because obviously that would be toxic to individuals. You want to have a mechanism whereby you can actually test your new inventions before you take it out to take them. So I think that that's what his title is all about, why we do them and how they can bring the world together. John's going to tell you not only how we do it here at St. Mike's, but John in the, in the GTA, but actually very broadly around the world. So uh, John is a, uh, a renowned scientist. I know that he's a really uh, in, uh, renowned person and is highly sought after because he uh, is, travels around the world all the time. A few times he's traveled to India for a day to give a talk and then came back the next day. So not everybody does that. So um, <laughs> it's really a pleasure and an honor to, uh, to number one, welcome you, uh, but also to introduce John for his talk today. Uh, OK, thank you. Thanks very much, Ari. Um, so uh, good to see who's here. Is there anybody here who has a medical background? So I can assume you have got no medical background. Okay, that's great. I want to also just give you a bit of a disclaimer. I hope to tell you what clinical trials are and why we do them. You may not get the answer to how they'll bring the world together, but I do want to show you that this actually, the conduct of clinical trials is really becoming a global, international kind of uh, collaboration. And what I'm going to do uh, is uh, start by talking about what a clinical trial is. And rather than tell you what it is, I want you to figure out how you would answer a question. So how many people here have had a cold? So pretty much everybody. How many people here take vitamin C when you have a cold? Okay. Why do you take vitamin C? How, I mean, how do, how do you know if vitamin C works? Yeah. Sorry? How do you know that? Uh, okay. Okay. Trial and error. I like, I like the fact that you've got a trial in that. I mean, so it's a, it's a good question. How do you know? Well, you might get, you go online, you Google it, and Wikipedia says uh, vitamin C is good because it boosts immunity. But how did, how did Wikipedia learn that? How did somebody else know? Or do we really know that? There's a lot of things that we do in medicine that we think we know the answer to, and we do it because that's what we think we should do. And when we study it, we find out either that it doesn't work at all, or if anything, it may actually harm uh, patients. And I'll show you just a couple of examples of that. But so life is full of questions that we want to come up with answers to. And trials are a tool to come up with answers to a question. It may be something that's immediately relevant uh, to everybody in this room, like, you know, can you get rid of the symptoms of cold uh, more rapidly? It may be something that's more relevant to a very specialized population of patients in the intensive care unit. So here's a guy in an ICU. I spend half my clinical life uh, working in an intensive care unit. And there's a million questions we could ask about how do we treat this uh, person who's <clears throat> very much kind of suspended between being alive and being dead, very high risk of not surviving. Uh, very high risk of having prolonged weakness, uh, post-traumatic stress di uh, disorder, uh, if he does survive. And so the question is, what can we do that could speed up his getting better and increase the probabilities of his surviving? So suppose his blood is a little bit on the low side. His hemoglobin level, normally uh, we like to, uh, and if you measure the amount of hemoglobin in our blood, you'll find it's about 120 to 150 grams per liter. And suppose his is 90 grams per liter. Do you think it would help if we gave him blood? Makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, he's got less, you know, he's down below a normal. But how would we know for sure? How do you know for sure? Try it. OK, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. That, and that's, that's fundamentally important in clinical trials. You never know unless you do it. But once you've done it, how do you know that it's made a difference? Yeah? 
you know, and that gets at a kind of clinical trial that's called the N of 1 trial. And it's something that works, it's not used very often, but it's a very, very clever idea for some kind of intervention that has a short effect and then it's off. So suppose it's something that uh, made you more awake. So you give somebody uh, a pill that has this drug in it or a placebo and you just measure how awake they are when they're, all the times they're getting the drug versus all the times they're getting the placebo. And there in one patient you can do it. But here we've got one patient and we don't know when we give him blood whether he is better because we've given him the blood or if he's better because we've been fiddling with the ventilator or do, you know, giving him, we do hundreds if not thousands of different things to a patient two days. So can you see any other way that we might have to figure out if it's helping him? Okay, well, let's just sort of develop this a little bit further because this is really what clinical trials are about. It's, it's answering questions and answering questions that are important to patients. And I'm going to be focusing on a kind of research that's called comparative effectiveness research. So I'm not talking about introducing fancy new drugs because by and large the advances we make in critical care are in figuring out how to do what we currently do but do it better. Uh, and uh, do better for the, uh, for the patient. So all research starts with a question. And I've kind of posed questions to you there, but you know, they may not be adequately framed. So the vitamin C question is the question, can we prevent uh, colds by giving vitamin C? Can we treat a cold? And if we treat a cold, what is it? Does the virus go away more rapidly? Do we feel better despite the fact we still have the virus? Uh, does it have to be a cold or is it any time we've got just a, a fever and we're not feeling so well? All of those are really critical because they're going to figure, that's going to frame how we ask the question, who we ask it in, and how we're going to study it. And I'll get on to that. The transfusion question, again, we want to know why is it we're giving it. Not, we don't do it just because the number is wrong, but the thinking has been uh, and it turns out we were wrong on that in critical illness, that because blood carries oxygen, if you have more blood, you carry more oxygen, and oxygen is good for tissues to be active metabolically. So in theory, if you give more blood, your tissues should be more metabolically active and you should get better quicker. So that's the question. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that one uh, with regard to uh, blood transfusion. Okay, so you can sort of see we've got to figure out uh, a way of asking a question that will generate an answer. And it turns out you can't, with the exception of this N of 1 trial that I, I mentioned, you can't really reliably answer a question in an individual patient. Because if I take vitamin C and I feel worse, it may just be that I've got a hangover. Uh, if you take vitamin C and you feel better, it may be that your cold's gotten better. So we just don't know what's driving it. And the only way we can do it is to actually study a whole bunch of people with the same condition and see if, on average, the people who got the treatment did better than the people who didn't get the treatment, okay? And that's really important, and I'm gonna sum that up at the, at the end of this uh, uh, portion of the talk. But it implies certain things here. First of all, we've gotta know who do we wanna treat. So if it's people, if it's vitamin C for a cold, is it anybody who's got the sniffles? Is it somebody who's actually got a rhinovirus, which is the virus that causes the cold? If it's, is it somebody who has early symptoms? If it's, is it somebody who's had symptoms for three days and not getting better? You can see that each one of those defines a slightly different question that we're asking. So first thing is to figure out what's the population of patients you want to treat. Then you have to figure out what's the intervention. In this case, it's going to be vitamin C, but it could be an antiviral drug, and that might be targeted at a very different population of patients. Okay, so the only way we can tell, though, if it works, is there's, you can't tell that in the abstract. There's no such thing as absolutely getting better, because we know everybody here has had a cold and everybody here has gotten better from the cold. Things change over time and things resolve because we've got a complex immune system that will clear a cold and we'll get better. So we don't know if it's just the normal natural history of the disease or whether what we did is making the difference. So how could we answer that question? What could we do that would be able to say, aha, it's likely that what I did to this patient made a difference? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Very clever, very clever. And good reading, good reading. So we often talk about that as being the control group in a study. So that's a, the patients who, get, who have the same condition but don't get the intervention that you had. And it's really critical here that you figure that the patients who you're using as your control group be exactly like the patients who are getting the intervention. 
in every respect, except they don't get the intervention. Okay? And then finally, we have to ask, okay, what do you mean getting better? Is it just, uh, you know, the interesting story about when insulin was introduced here. Now, it's almost 100 years ago right now. Insulin is uh, a Toronto uh, innovation. It has fundamentally changed the way diabetes has been uh, treated. It got uh, Banting and Best a Nobel Prize within about 18 months of their having tried it in a patient. You know how they figured out that it worked? They went and saw the patient, they gave it to the next day, and they said, the boy looked better and said he felt better. And that's how insulin became standard treatment for, for diabetes. We can't do that anymore. Medicine has gotten, because we've made advances, because we've got higher expectations, it's much more complicated. So we've got to figure out what's the outcome. So for our vitamin C study, we're not going to look at mortality, for example. <coughs> We're not expecting that's going to have a difference in mortality. But what would be some outcomes you could use in this vitamin C study? Yep? Sure, sure. So we maybe come up with a score that measured symptoms, and you might put together five different things, you know, sneezing, temperature, chills, and that kind of stuff, and create a score and see if the score is different between the two patients. Yeah? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely time to resolution. And that's a good one because that actually is quite sensitive to an effect if you can actually measure the time until the patient feels better. Yeah? Um, yeah, so that's kind of, that would sort of be a little bit like the duration of the symptoms and the, the total symptoms. You might use that as a stratification at the beginning. It might be, for example, the patients who have really bad symptoms get much better with vitamin C than patients who have minimal symptoms. And that sort of gets back to the, the population that you want to study. So you can see there are, oh, sorry, yes, please. Like, you viral yeah, sure, absolutely. You could take something really objective, like the viral level. And you can see each of these has advantages and disadvantages. If you measure the virus, then you can answer the question, does vitamin C improve the clearance of the virus? And that's an important question to answer. But somebody says, a trialist would say, well, who cares if the patient doesn't feel any better if you've changed the virus? So we measure the symptoms, or we measure the duration of the symptoms. But that doesn't necessarily tell you that it's because of its effect on the cold. It ju may just be that vitamin C feels good, and you still, you're still every bit as sick as you were, but you're feeling better because you like vitamin C. <clears throat> sure. Sure, you're, ta you're talking you could have some kind of a marker of what's going on inside the body. And that, I, that, again, is really important to help you understand how it's doing it. It doesn't necessarily tell you whether it's beneficial. And, and, and the basic message here is not that there's a right or a wrong. It's what your outcome, what outcome you measure is going to be based on what question you're asking. And it's going to only give you an answer in the limited area of that question. So if we want to know the effect on, on the, the cold virus, let's measure the virus thing. If we want to look at the effect on global metabolism and immune inflammatory response, let's measure a bunch of inflammatory mar markers. If we don't care about that and we just want to feel, know if the patient feels better, let's measure a symptom score. And you know, if it's just because the patient got vitamin C, it doesn't really matter. If, you, if it has no effect at all, but you just feel better because you like vitamin C, most people would say, I'd rather feel better than not feel better. So that, that's actually OK. So you can see there's a lot of um, uh, probability and uncertainty in asking clinical questions. And that's just the nature of the beast. You can't, uh, we can't be uh, any more precise than that. So um, the other problem that we have, though, is suppose I said half the people in this room are going to get vitamin C, half of the patients aren't going to get vitamin C. Uh, you guys are getting the vitamin C. Come back in a week and we'll see uh, uh, whether there was an effect. What's the problem with that? Yeah? Okay, that's possible. And, and uh, that gets very much to the first point here. So there's going to be variability. In, in any group of people. Some people may have a you know, genetic condition, some people may be younger, some people may be older, some people may have an underlying undiagnosed condition, some people may just be you know, tough and they, their symptoms aren't as bad. We're, a very, you know, we're variable, but in theory, if we divide the people up randomly, those traits should be equally balanced in, in both groups. Okay, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. So you think, well, I, I must feel better because they gave me the pill and these guys didn't get, we didn't get the pill. How could we possibly feel better? So you've, you've got a subjective bias because we're using a subject, 
you know, we, that's not going to impact the viral load, but it will impact your, your symptom score, right? Because you so, so subjectively feel better. Yeah? Well, they might because of the vitamin C. They may say, look, I'm taking vitamin C. I probably should get more water just to make sure that I don't get, end up with kidney stones. And it may be the water's making a difference. So all of these things are what we call bias, OK? And, and uh, it, it bias is not that people are trying to cheat. It's just that we look at the world, and we see it through the lens that's the way we see the world. And so what you want to do in a clinical trial is do everything you can to minimize bias. And so you've actually identified almost the, all of the ways we have of doing it. One of it is to assign people randomly. Suppose we knew that if you had blonde hair, you were more likely to respond to vitamin C than if you didn't. So if there are more blondes in one group than another group, we're going to get a result, which is not because of the intervention, but it's because of the differences in the population. But if we randomize, we should get equal numbers of blondes in each group. But there's a million other things that could impact this that we don't even know about. And the beauty of randomization is when you randomly assign people, the chances are that you'll have equal numbers of people with each risk factor in each group. Not precisely the same number, but roughly the same number. So you'll minimize bias. If you blind the study, so these people who, are getting, who aren't getting vitamin C get a pill that looks like vitamin C that they have to take, and as far as anybody can tell, it's the same. And if I'm the, the uh, experimenter and measuring the symptom score, I shouldn't know what treatment that the patient got, because I would be then biased in the way I evaluated it. Yeah? Wouldn't they, like, so function, like, when you know, if you're getting a pump, they don't, like, it looks exactly like this, you wouldn't, kind of your brain would say, like, oh, I'm getting better, because you think that you're getting better. Uh, yes, but you know what? That happens with placebos, too. If you think that placebo is an active pill, you will feel better. So that's the beauty of blinding, is that you kind of get over that problem of the kind of subjective uh, bias of it. One further thing we, we can do is in randomizing patients, you want to make sure that the next patient who gets enrolled in the trial, you can't guess what arm they're in. And that's called concealment of allocation. So what you do, suppose we were studying you know, uh, 20 people at St. Michael's Hospital, and we had them in blocks of four, because we want to end up with roughly similar numbers in each group. If every time we, had, uh, if we gave the intervention, we, had, we knew there were four patients, and we'd given three patients the intervention and we knew that two got the active intervention and one got placebo, then we know that the next one is going to get a placebo. And you don't want to do that. So the way you get around that is by changing the size of the blocks you're randomizing patients by. If you don't follow it, don't worry about it all that much. The critical things are the important role that uh, uh, randomization and uh, blinding uh, play. Okay, so we've done that. We're doing things randomly. The assumption we're now going to make is that anything we see happened randomly. And if we see something that didn't, doesn't look like it happened randomly, then we're going to say, well, it's a result of the thing that we did in the trial, uh, the one intervention, the uh, pill uh, that uh, has vitamin C in it, uh, the transfusion we gave. So you look at this. Do, do you see, here's uh, the results of a coin flip. Did that happen by chance or not? What do you think? It looks like it did, didn't it? It's, they're not exact. There's, I think, what, 12 heads and uh, eight tails, but that's pretty close. That looks like what we'd expect if we did this uh, just on a purely random basis. And we can actually calculate the likelihood that this happened randomly. So there, you use statistics for this. You can measure the relative risk of getting a head, and it's just only uh, slightly over one, which means it happened purely randomly. But the important thing here is that the range of possibilities across that. And you can see that it includes the possibility of one. So we calculate what's called a p-value, which is just the likelihood that this happened randomly. And it turns out that three out of four times this just happened randomly. So odds are there's nothing going on there. We don't know for sure. There may be. And that's the essence of science. We never know for sure. We're simply playing the odds that something probably happened. So let's look at this then. What about here? Do you think this is all a, a random a toss, or did somebody kind of go in and flip over some of the coins? What do you think? Why? Exactly. And that's the essence of a clinical trial. <clears throat> Somebody's been fiddling with the coins, and it's the intervention that you, that you use. But we can actually measure this, too. So we can do the same statistical test. 
calculate the chances that this occurred purely randomly. And it turns out uh, that it is less than one chance in 20. And if you ever come across a scientific study, we usually have a p, what's called a p-value, and it says it's p less than 0.05. This is just something we made up because we say, look, you know, if it's less than one chance in 20, pretty likely there's something <laughs> systematic that's responsible for that, and this is not just random chance. But it's a purely arbitrary thing. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, well, yes, this is actually a chi-square test, yeah, or a Fisher exact test. That's absolutely right. Um, and, and as I say, the, the, P, we, we, the fact that, it had, that the p-value is 0.04, how would you interpret that? What does that mean? Does that mean that, does that tell you that somebody fiddled around with those coins? Yeah? If you do the chi-square test, the between 1% and 5%, it's quite significant that someone would say that there's some deviation other than just chance. Okay, but, but, what, but I want to know the truth. Did this happen by chance, or, or was there something going on? Yep. Right, you do not know. And, and, and any time you hear about people coming up with scientific proof, there is no scientific proof. But it's like life. You don't know when you cross the street that you're not going to get hit by a car, but you're pretty confident you're not. And so we don't you know, live our lives preparing for any strange possibility that might happen to us, um, we do what's most likely to happen. And all of medicine is based on this. That it's, we never know for sure that something works, but we think probably it does. And if it's more likely to benefit a patient than to harm them, then we'd go with the thing that's gonna be beneficial. Okay, so let me just show you one more uh, thing here. So the critical question is how many patients do we have to study then to, to, to get something like this? I showed you 20 coin tosses, but that second one was 17 heads and three tails. And it's unlikely that a drug is gonna have that dramatic an effect. You know, somebody's gonna feel a little bit better, somebody's gonna feel a little bit worse. And you wanna know on aggregate, do people more feel better or do they feel worse after the drug? And so you can actually calculate uh, how many patients you would need to study to do this. And what you do is you figure out, okay, what's going to be the event rate in the control population? Suppose it is uh, symptoms at seven days of a cold. Say 40% say are going to have it. And you say, okay, well, I think that vitamin C will reduce this down to 20%. So you've now got, uh, you're trying to calculate from 40 to 20. You just go to a table and, cal and it will tell you how many patients you need to have to be able to see that using a uh, chi-square chi test. And so it, you want to base this on what's a clinically important effect, how much money do you have to do the study. Oops, let's go back here a little bit. So here's a, an example of that. Remember I showed you that, that, that uh, earlier thing. You won't be able to see the heads and tails, but now rather than it being 12 heads and uh, uh, eight tails, it's now 240 heads and 160 tails. Do you think that happened, Brandon? Sorry? Well, you can. You can actually, and, and I, I didn't quite go back far enough. Uh, uh, but you, you can tell this. Um, you, you can actually calculate a chi-square on this. And, and when you do that, remember it was point seven, the p-value was 0.75 when we had 20 uh, experiments. Here with 400 experiments, the same relative risk ratio, it's now the p-value is 0 0.006. So that's... That means that there's six chances in a thousand that this happened on the basis of random chance. But what you can see is the more times you do this, the more likely you are to be more, more confident that you're seeing something that, is, uh, that reflects reality, okay? And as I say, there are ways that you can calculate how many patients you have to have or how many experiments you have to have to, to uh, actually do that. Okay. so. The, the principal issue here is that you never know for sure, and you never know in the individual patient. We're describing outcomes in populations of patients. And what we're kind of looking at is what is the average patient, the top person on that bell curve like, and do the averages, these two averages overlap so much that they're probably the same group of people, or are they separated, and if they're separated, then that implies that the one thing that was different between the groups, the experimental intervention, had that effect. Uh, so it's really important when you go to actually apply this information to patients because we shouldn't treat all patients the same way because we don't know if our patient is at the top of this curve over here or over here. And so you really need to use 
uh, a lot of additional information on applying results of research. But you do get some really important information from doing that research. OK, so, so that's the, you know, what is a clinical trial? Um, and I think the important uh, things that you should take away from this is that science doesn't prove things. It doesn't tell us the truth. It just tells us what is likely to be true about the world. And we have ways that we can actually measure how likely it is to be true. It is only as credible as the steps we take to minimize bias. And that's a huge problem in a lot of medical research that's not done properly, that there is unconscious bias that is actually manipulating the result so that we think it's true when it, it isn't. Um, this is critical. You can do a study that shows a huge effect, but it's completely irrelevant because the uh, intervention is not particularly important. The outcome isn't particularly important. Good research is critically dependent on the question that you've asked. Uh, and uh, that's really where impactful research differs from non-impactful non research, is how well has the investigator framed a question. Clinical trials are costly, but it is the foundation of all medical care. This is how we know whether you do or don't give vitamin C uh, is the results we get from clinical trials. It's also how we know uh, whether to transfuse patients. OK, let me just stop there and see if there are any questions. OK. Um, so very quick history. The first time this was ever actually done, uh, was actually with vitamin C, and this was the James Lind. He was the surgeon on a uh, ship in the British Navy back in the 18th century, and they noticed that a lot of uh, sailors, when they're off at sea for prolonged periods of time, were getting very sick, uh, developing this disease called scurvy. And so uh, Lind decided he would do an experiment to see if he could figure out what caused scurvy. And so there were a lot of things that they thought might be uh, responsible for it. They thought it might be uh, not enough salt. They thought it might be uh, not enough acid. Uh, so he came up with a bunch of different things that might change the course of, of scurvy. And he took a very small number of sailors, uh, 12 sailors, and he randomized them to get either cider, so they would drink cider, sulfuric acid, vinegar, seawater, I don't think any of us particularly want to be in those three groups. Two uh, sailors got oranges and lemons, and two sailors got barley water. And this was just based on things that might be responsible for scurvy. And to his good fortune and to the good fortune of science, the two sailors who got oranges and lemon got out of bed and started helping look after the other sailors who were still sick. And so it became apparent that it was the oranges and lemons that were making the difference. And it wasn't just their acidity, because they didn't see that with the vinegar or with the sulfuric acid. Uh, it wasn't that they tasted good because they didn't see that with the cider. It wasn't just that it was uh, liquid because they didn't see it with salt water or the barley water. So there was something else in the oranges and lemons, and it turned out that something else was vitamin C. Uh, and that's how we know that vitamin C, or that scurvy, scurvy is a deficiency of uh, vitamin C. So this was the first clinical trial uh, ever done. We now do trials that are a lot more sophisticated than that. And the, real, the person who kind of did the first modern clinical trial is this guy, uh, Bradford Hill. He was the one who really uh, emphasized the importance of trying to minimize bias in a clinical trial. And he did a study of streptomycin and tuberculosis that really established streptomycin as a key element in treating tuberculosis and changing the outcome for people who had uh, TB. But it's now kind of become the standard to do clinical trials. And I'm going to just, in the last little bit of this talk, um, uh, more introduce you to how that culture and uh, um, process occurs uh, in the critical care community. So this is a, a resort in Western Canada. It's called Emerald Lake. And back in 1989, uh, a group of us, there were about 10 or 12 intensivists, got together with the idea that we were going to do clinical trials to uh, figure out what the best treatments were for critically ill patients in an intensive care unit. Really neat idea. It was led by a guy by the name of Tom Todd, who was also a surgeon uh, from Toronto. We met at this thing, came up with some good ideas, but there was a real problem uh, after we'd been talking for about uh, two hours that morning, was that we had a couple of ideas, but we couldn't agree on which thing we should study. We couldn't agree on who was going to lead it, uh, on where it was going to be based, what city it was going to be based in, on whether or not somebody's data set should be used, database should be used, or somebody else's should be used. It really got quite contentious and quite nasty to the point we thought, look, this may just be an idea that's not going to go anywhere. And so what we did is we said, look, OK, we're going to take a break. We're going to go out 
uh, hiking in the Rockies, they're going to go up canoeing on Emerald Lake, wander around, come on back at four, we'll see if we can resolve these issues or if we all go home and say we just can't do it. And as you can probably imagine, by four o'clock when people caught, came back, all of these things that had seemed to be lethal to our collaborating uh, had gone. And we were able to kind of come up with a, a way of working together. And so Canadian Critical Care Trials Group is now one of the most active uh, groups in the world. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the things that it's done, uh, I guess I don't have it there. Uh, you know, we've got close to 300 publications. We've got 18 publications in the New England Journal of Medicine. We've got over 300 members, like 70 or $80 million uh, in funding, uh, uh, about 60 or 70 different programs going on. It's a very, very active group. And one of the things that we realized that is also critical to good science, quite apart from everything that I showed you earlier, is being able to get along with the people you work with, to collaborate, to respect, to challenge, and so we, when we hold our meetings, hold them out of the way places where we have time in, during the day to go skiing, to go you know, golfing, whatever people like to do, rollerblading. And we also make sure that at night we have dinners together and we have time for drinking, dancing, and just really getting to trust each other. Because that's really the core of good science. It means the next day that somebody can say to me, look, you idiot, that's stupid. Why don't you consider such and such? And I won't feel that I'm being attacked for who I am. This is just a good friend of mine who wants me to do a little bit better. So I mentioned the, this issue about transfusion. We actually asked this question. This is Paul Bear, who's the current chair of the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group. Back in uh, the 1990s, in, in, the standard was to transfuse patients when their hemoglobin dropped below 100. So like I mentioned, that guy who had a hemoglobin of 90, we would have given him two units of blood. So Paul came to us and he said, look, I've got a great, he had just finished doing his, uh, uh, research training, he said, I got a great idea for a study. Why don't we transfuse patients back to a normal level, get their hemoglobin up, that way they can deliver more oxygen and they'll get better faster. Sensible idea, right? Certainly seemed to make a lot of sense to a lot of people at the time. But this was in the 1990s when hepatitis C was in the blood supply, there was concerns about HIV AIDS in the blood supply. Uh, there was a lot of litigation going on about its safety, and people were saying, well, do we all really have to transfuse? So we sat around for about two or three hours, and again, it underlines the importance of, of trust and collegiality with the people you're working with. We sat around for a couple of hours, and at the end of that couple of hours, we realized that Paul's question was a good one, but there was a much better one. Why were we transfusing to 100, and could we get away with less blood? And so we did a series of studies that led to this trial, which is called the TRIC trial, that showed if you let the blood, the hemoglobin drop down to 70 before you transfused, on average, patients did better. There was a trend to better survival and a lower rate of organ dysfunction in those patients who got less blood. So completely counterintuitive, but you would only find that if you did the clinical trial and if you really had figured out what the question is. So the good question was give more blood. The great question was why are we even doing that and is that necessary to do it? And, and so a lot of the work that's really being done in critical care is on common things that we do now where we find if you do less of it, uh, patients actually do better. Oh, here's the uh, summary of uh, what the Charles group has done. So this model has actually taken off in many, many different countries. The, in Australia and New Zealand, they have refined it. They do 7,000 patient trials. They are an incredibly dynamic group that virtually every intensive care unit in Australia and New Zealand is a part of. Uh, it, there's a group in Germany, there's groups in Scandinavia, in the United Kingdom, in uh, France, in Spain, in Greece. Um, there's groups uh, outside of North America, Europe, and Australasia. So this is Fernando Bozza who heads up the Brazilian group. They've just done a large 20,000 patient study uh, in looking at the role of a checklist in the, uh, in the ICU. There's a Chinese critical care clinical trials group. This is uh, Ben Du who heads that up. And they're now moving into doing uh, clinical trials as well. Uh, most of their studies have been observational studies, but you can see the same idea really is, is gaining some traction in other parts of the world. And so about 10 years ago, a group of us got together and said, look, we're all doing similar kinds of research, similar model, uh, similar problems that we face. Can we do more by trying to get together and figure out how we could support each other, address common uh, problems, raise the profile of investigator-led research? 
And so this is Granada, Spain, where we first met and formed what's called the International Forum for Acute Care Trialists, which is a network of these uh, investigator-led uh, trials groups. It's unfunded, it's uh, very inclusive, and we've now got over 30 uh, member groups that come from uh, all around the world. Uh, so North America, Europe, uh, Australia, and Asia, but we've also got groups uh, in uh, every continent. So there are three groups coming from Latin America, uh, three groups from Asia, uh, and two groups even from Africa, one from North Africa and one from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So we've really kind of got the world covered in, in, in the most preliminary kind of way with people who are doing investigator-led uh, research. And it means we can do some really cool things because we can ask questions on a global scale. We can ask, how does access to services vary by country? So we did a study looking at seven different cities in, in different continents and looked at the actual access they had to acute care resources. We've come up with estimates of how common the problem of severe infection or sepsis is around the world. We're even coming up with some ideas about how do you decide what the uh, denominator is going to be for something like that. Um, so we can come back here. Uh, so one of the things we've been doing, we've been working with uh, people who are involved in pandemic preparedness, and we've launched a study to actually understand globally severe respiratory infection. It's called sprint SARI. We measure the number of patients with respiratory infections admitted to an intensive care unit over a five-day period. And the idea here is we're trying to create a global network of interlinked intensive care units so that when we have the next pandemic, we can very quickly do uh, observational uh, research. And so we're working with the World Health Organization in accomplishing this. We're doing studies on antimicrobial resistance, because again, this is a global problem to try to understand how does it vary from one country to the next so that we can maybe see some factors that we could change uh, to uh, uh, reduce rates of antibiotic resistance. We've got a very active program in trying to train and educate uh, clinicians in other parts of the world in doing clinical research being led by Charles Garmersol out of Hong Kong. They've developed a, a teaching program that we gave in Afghanistan last fall to train people to become uh, clinical uh, researchers. That's actually from the uh, meeting in uh, Karachi. So all of this kind of speaks to the model of collaboration. I'm gonna just kind of conclude with this. We are moving into an era where, to me, the single most important thing in thinking about doing clinical research is thinking about how can I collaborate better in doing that research. There's many reasons to think about collaborating. You can, you, you, if, if we can get an answer with more patients, we can get 10 or 20,000 patients much faster if we recruit them from five different countries than if we do it from uh, one uh, country. We also understand it's more generalizable because we are able to see how something works or doesn't work in different uh, healthcare systems. And basically, it is a, to me, it's an extremely important tool to kind of bring together people who are looking after the same kinds of patients, but in very, very different political and cultural systems. So that there's some real importance in the camaraderie uh, and the development of the science there. So here's an example of why this is important. There was a very uh, um, uh, influential study published in 2001 that suggested if you normalized blood sugar in the intensive care unit, patients would do better. And all kinds of people put a lot of money, hospitals put a tremendous amount of resources into figuring out how do we keep the blood sugar normal. So we did a study, uh, Canada and Australia working together, where we asked this question, and we found that actually if you normalize the blood sugar, the mortality rate was slightly higher. You had a two or 3% higher mortality rate. But we had to get 6,000 patients to be able to see that effect. But it's really important if you're one of those two to 3% of patients who uh, is having their blood sugar uh, normalized. And as I'll also say, it's also, I'll show you later, it's important for the system. So a number of different models of collaboration. You can have one lead group and, and other groups kind of uh, participating in an ad hoc fashion. We just did a study on the age of transfused blood that showed no difference if you use old blood versus uh, fresh blood. Uh, we, you can do harmonized studies where you have, in this case, three different groups did more or less the same protocol and then agreed to put them all together. And what this showed is that a very influential uh, protocol for resuscitating patients wasn't nearly as effective as people thought they, it was. And so that was important in how hospitals and health systems uh, spent their uh, resources. You can integrate studies. The study I showed you of uh, 
uh, blood sugar control was two different groups using exactly the same protocol. And then the very neat thing that we are working on right now is the idea of doing what's called a platform trial, where you ask a question about a disease rather than about the intervention in the disease. So rather than studying uh, vitamin C, we would study uh, colds, and we would look at multiple different potential interventions, and we'd use uh, techniques that allow us to uh, either reject or include that intervention and incorporate it into the control arm as the trial goes forward. And so this is a model where you're beginning to see clinical research and the process of quality improvement, the boundaries between them uh, becoming blurred. Um, and this work is very much behind trying to build uh, uh, capacity for the next uh, pandemic. One challenge here is, there's a lot of challenges. One of them is just how do you uh, um, acknowledge the many people that are involved in a large-scale collaboration, like this one that was done by Dr. Odd et al. Uh, Dr. Odd was only one of several authors who published this particular paper. This is what physicists do. They put everybody's name on the paper, 5,154 authors on this paper. <laughs> And I think we have to think about doing that in medicine because we've got to acknowledge that this is large-scale collaboration. It's, making, it's going to have large-scale effects, and it's uh, important that people get acknowledged for it. Finally, when we do this, it's not just that we are helping patients, but we can also reduce costs. We did these two studies here, one where we looked at a, a technique for preventing blood clots. And we showed that one technique was slightly better than the other, very, very small effect. But if you use that technique, the average ICU would save a million dollars a year. So it's really unusual. Our transfusion study showed it's better if you got less. We're not only helping patients, but we're saving the healthcare system money. Our study uh, looking at albumin as a resuscitation fluid showed it's no better. Again, we can save the healthcare system money. We, can, we spend, in Canada, 0.2% of gross domestic product on critical care. And so if we can save money, we can save hundreds of millions of dollars by doing these studies. And one of the things that implies is that we can make the case that we have, this is no longer niche research. This is core to practicing medicine. And the funding of these trials should be coming out of the healthcare system uh, budgets. So I think uh, there's a lot of implications in the way that clinical trials are evolving. Uh, and the, probably the most important one is this trend towards uh, linking them to patient important outcomes in a collaborative and uh, international uh, kind of way and ultimately hopefully funded not out of the small amounts of money that groups like C uh, CIHR have but out of the much larger uh, pots of money that the healthcare system has. Um, just to make the point that intensive care is global, virtually every country in the world has some kind of an intensive care unit. Uh, and it's expensive. And so we're kind of privileged to be working in this field because we can really work at the forefront of a new model of uh, clinical research collaboration. So I'm going to stop there. I think I've probably gone a little bit over the half hour time, but uh, stop there. And well, thanks very much for your attention.